I know that this is starting from the basics, but we're going to be um, doing more and more complicated things when I do my further presentations. And for some of you, this will be new, as Carol said, and for some of you, this will be old hat. And what we're trying to do is ensure that every ICP has a chance to be at a standardized level of understanding of surveillance so that they're not feeling like they don't have the support they need. So we're going to start from the basics. So surveillance is the ongoing systematic collection and analysis and interpretation of health-related data essential to the planning, implementation, and evaluation of IPNC practice, closely integrated with the timely pre dis dissemination of this information to those who are responsible for infection control. So not only is it collecting, it's um, analyzing, interpreting, and then giving back information to people who need it. So why do we conduct surveillance? It's to assess the health of our populations that we're caring for, to estimate the magnitude of a disease, to understand the natural history of a disease. And that's kind of important because if C. difficile isn't responding to treatment on your units, why might that be happening? What might be changing? And this actually occurred in Quebec a number of years back, probably about 10 years by now, where a different variant of C. difficile came through and none of the previous treatments were working and they had huge outbreaks going on. Speaking of outbreaks, surveillance is necessary to detect outbreaks, uh, to document the distribution and spread of disease within a unit or whole facility, to hypothesize about what might be happening that causes this disease to evaluate how your control strategies are working, and as I said, to monitor for changes in disease characteristics. Okay. There's three more points that we do, why we do surveillance. It's to assess the quality of our health care. So these are process um, uh, auditing not so much auditing n number of cases, but this would be like your hand hygiene audits to determine whether or not things are improving in the in the care of the quality of care. For some, you identify research needs or where research needs to take place. And for uh, lastly, it's to help the facility plan for the future. Okay, uh, can you see the slide that says surveillance characteristics? Yes. Oh, well, that's great because it's not freezing, obviously, then. I had that problem yesterday. Okay, surveillance characteristics. Surveillance is always outcome-oriented. And they have to be simple, as simple as you can get them, flexible, so you can adapt to change, acceptable to the people who have to use it, sensitive, in other words, you have to be able to find the cases that you're looking for, show predictive value positive, which means a probability that if you find a case, that case is actually a true case and not just a false positive. They have to be representative, so if you do surveillance, and you're only taking a sample of your population, it has to represent your whole population. And that's often what hand hygiene auditing is about. You're not auditing all the time, every shift, every one. You're taking a sample and you want to make sure that it's representative of your whole, um, the whole time that you're actually um, doing hand hygiene. And it has to be timely. In other words, if you do it, you have to give back information to those who need it in a timely way, otherwise you're not actually assisting with anything. There's many types of surveillance. Uh, the first two that, um, that you know about, that you probably already do, are total surveillance or targeted surveillance. The surveillance that you've done for years in, in the personal care homes has been called targeted surveillance, but I know in the past, there was total surveillance that did take place, and that is um, quite laborious. 
There's other types of surveillance. They can be broken down into two other types, retrospective or prospective. Retrospective means you look back in the past, what has happened in the past. Prospective means you're looking forward and always gathering the case information as it actually is happening. So that's usually what you are doing when you're looking at um, the cases that are coming in to your facility of, let's say, um, a respiratory illness. You know about them and you're following them immediately. That's prospective. Retrospective is usually used more for um, studies where you collect a number of charts, you go back in the past to determine which risk factors may have resulted in them getting the disease. Another types of surveillance is um, there's two ways to complete surveillance, passive and active. Passive surveillance is where you wait for the data to come to you. So I know in hospitals, it's a little bit of both because passive surveillance is where they wait for the lab result to come to them. But actively, they go out onto the units to see what might actually be happening. So they go looking actively for the, for the cases that might be happening. So I'm not sure. I still have to learn how this might work in PCHs because I'm still new to, P to the long-term care and PCH program. Okay, now we're going to go over a few definitions because some of these will be um, you'll know about and some of them will be new. So the attack rate, and that's the number of cases of disease over the total population that could get the disease during a specific time period. The attack rate shows up on your CNISP, um, so, sorry, your SINFI forms that you do for your outbreaks where it asks you how many cases of disease do you have, and then it asks you how many people are on that unit who could get sick. And they actually calculate the attack rate for you. Baseline, it's the number or value to which you compare to. So I know that, let's say you have in your facility, usually two cases of MRSA that come up and are found in, let's say, wounds, once uh, once a month, two cases a month. And it's pretty consistent, two cases a month. That would be your baseline. So if all of a sudden you had five in one month, you might want to look at, see what happened, what was different about that month. So cases, that's an instance of a particular disease that meets specific criteria. And that's important because often... Um, the criteria for an infection has to meet a specific definition. A cluster. A cluster isn't quite necessarily an outbreak. It's a group of cases closely related in time and place without determining whether or not they're more than expected. So they're just, you have a cluster of cases, you're thinking they might be an outbreak, but you haven't done the investigation yet to determine whether or not it's more than expected. Okay, um, denominator, if you're making a ratio of how many cases over patient days, the denominator is the lower portion of the ratio. Endemic use, means the usual presence of a disease within a population or geographical area. So usually influenza is endemic in winter here in Manitoba. This last year was very unusual because our endemic influenza didn't show up, probably because of all the, pu the public health measures that we were doing. Incidence. Incidence is the measure of the frequency of new instances of a disease in a defined population over a defined period. So it usually includes the number of new cases over this is a ratio, so over the population at risk. So your instance would be, let's say you had those five cases of MRSA over the population that was at risk, which would be the population in your facility. 
A numerator is that top portion of a ratio. A few more definitions. Prevalence is the proportion of a persons in a population who have a particular disease at a specific point in time. Prevalence is usually used for things like cancer, so it looks not at who's new, who has this in a new way, but just in general, how many cases exist in this population right now. A rate is the frequency at which in instances of disease occur in a defined population over a unit of time. And that's what you usually need to do on a regular basis is determine your rate of disease in your population so that you can compare. You can't compare very well um, between your facility and maybe another facility if unless you convert them to rates. The, diff the reason for that is let's say you're trying to compare a facility that has 150 beds to a facility that has 500 beds. If you just count cases, you can't, you're comparing apples and oranges. You're not comparing apples and apples. If you convert them both to rates, then you can compare. Sensitivity is the ability of a test to find true cases. And specificity is the ability of a test to exclude people who are not positive. So in other words, to exclude the negatives. And lastly, validity is the, the degree to which a test actually measures what it's supposed to measure. My last two slides are going to talk about calculating a rate because this is um, what will be expected in the future as we talk more about how to do surveillance. So first, we're just going to talk about how to calculate the rate. There are, let's say, four cases in your facility of C. difficile in one month. And there were 35 admissions during this time frame. I know that you guys have fewer admissions um, per month. And I'm just, I took a guess at, let's say, 35. So this equals a rate of 114.3 cases per 1,000 patient admissions. And I put the math underneath it to show you how I got to that number. You put the four, which is the number of cases, over the 35, which is the number of admissions, and you times it by 1,000, because otherwise the number would be too small, and you can't compare it easily, and it equals 114.3 cases per 1,000 patient admissions. We have something that we compare to in acute care that's a national benchmark. There are no national benchmarks for long-term care yet, but I know that that is something that is under discussion at the national level, that maybe there should be more surveillance that's shared amongst provinces. So this is just something to keep in the back of your mind that hopefully someday there will be national benchmarks to compare to. But that being said... Patient admissions is not the best way to compare long-term care rates because there's so few admissions. And they can go dramatically up and down each month depending on your patient population. So this is the best way to calculate a rate. And it's using patient days. And I know that your um, surveillance has been using patient days for quite some time. So let's say there's that same four cases of C. difficile in one month and you had, let's say, 650 patient days during this time frame. So you had a really small personal care home. This would equal to 61.5 cases per 10,000 patient days. There we go because you put the 4 over top of the 650 times 10,000, and that equals 61.5 cases per 10,000 patient days. I know in the past you've been comparing it to 1,000 patient days, but the national um, standard way of comparing is actually using 10,000 patient days. So you times it by 10,000. Um, 
There probably will be some changes to the way you do surveillance in the next while as the program standardizes and we um, do things more similar between acute care and long-term care. And so the way you do surveillance and the spreadsheets that you have to work on might be changing in the future. And then the formulas that will be embedded in that will take into account the 10,000 patient days. And that's all I have to say today.